my name is Monica Allred. I'm the Senior Director for Marketing and Strategic Communications here at the Cronkite School. And today for our uh, Cronkite Live last uh, event of the semester, we're talking about misinformation warfare uh, with Scott Bork. And uh, the reason that we're doing this event is because we actually got some requests from students uh, wanting uh, this topic. And it's, it's very timely considering what's going on in the world um, and what students may encounter um, as they begin their careers or even internships. Um, Scott is um, uh, one of our adjunct faculty, a faculty associate here at Cronkite. He has taught uh, classes uh, previous semesters and I believe coming up in the spring as well. Um, Scott is a U.S. Navy combat correspondent and information warfare specialist. He did that in Afghanistan, um, and he's got great information to share. Um, so without further ado, Scott, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Monica. Um, I just want to say I'm not currently a, a Navy combat correspondent. I was back in the day. It almost feels like a lifetime ago. Um, and thank you for thinking of me. You know, this is kind of my area of expertise is uh, information warfare, military information and the intersection between military and media. And as journalists, we are the media. So when we think about weapons of war, we tend to think of bombs, bullets, tanks, howitzers, submarines, aircraft carriers. And yes, those are the weapons that actually do the killing in combat. But in a democratic society, information is what gives the government consent from their people to go to war and do the killing. So without information, all of those weapons just sit in a stockpile not being used. In order for a war to be effective, it requires popular support. It needs civilians to believe that their side is the good side and the other side is the bad side. The people need to believe that sending their young men and women off to some foreign land to go kill and die is justified. And you also need to convince the enemy civilians that their government is acting against their best interest. You need to convince the Russian civilians that Vladimir Putin is acting against them. And you need to convince Vladimir Putin's oligarchs to desert him, um, that he's not worth dying and losing all your money for. So in warfare, information is just as important and just as deadly a weapon as any bomb or bullet. And for centuries, shooting wars have been fought, won, and lost based on who won the information war. So today we're going to discuss the role of information in warfare, specifically as it pertains to information targeting the media and targeting civilians. Information warfare is a very broad topic, but we're going to focus on how it affects civilian journalists and civilian populations. So for those of you that don't know me, uh, I'm Scott Bork. Um, as Monica said, I'm an associate faculty member here at the Cronkite School. I've been working in one form or another in journalism and mass communication for almost 14 years now. Um, I first got my start, again, as she said, as a US Navy combat correspondent um, deploying to Afghanistan and Japan. Uh, my job there was to shoot photo and video documentation of U.S. operations. And while I was there, I qualified as an information warfare specialist. Currently, though, I guess I did these slides out of order. Currently, I'm a communication consultant for nonprofit organizations. I advise reporters and news agencies on how to cover military and veterans issues. And I'm a former public radio journalist. And I don't know if Dr. Gilpin's in the chat right now. I'll never forgive her for taking this only photo of me presenting research and my eyes are closed, but you know, it's a photo of me being all academic. Um, but yeah, like I said, I'm a former US Navy videographer and public affairs NCO. I served in Japan and Afghanistan. I uh, qualified as a US Navy information warfare specialist. So while I have a pretty broad knowledge of information warfare as a whole, my specialty really focuses on how it interacts with the media. And so that's, you know, young me taking video on the border of Afghanistan and Tajikistan over 10 years ago. So broadly, let's talk a little bit about what information warfare is. A lot of times when we hear people talk about information warfare, we think about cyber warfare. We think about hacking, cyber attacks, and the control of information. And while that's a big part of it, again, for our purposes, we're talking about how information is controlled and distributed to civilian populations. And as members of the media, we have considerable influence over those civilian populations. So militaries and belligerent parties in war tend to target us. Uh, despite all the people say, you know, we're the fake news, they don't trust us, 
the media still has considerable sway. Um, the long and short of information warfare is that it is the use of information to achieve military objectives. And there are three main targets. The first target of information warfare are governments. You as an information warfare you know, as a military, you want to control what the other side sees. You want to have influence over their intelligence and influence over their intelligence analysts and find a way to influence their decision making. A very prominent example of this is from the 1991 uh, Operation Desert Storm. General Norman Schwarzkopf wanted to trick Saddam Hussein, so he staged what was called Operation Left Hook. And that was an information operation against Saddam Hussein and the Iraqi army. If you look at the map here, you'll see that you had all of these U.S. forces lined up against Kuwait and all of these other U.S. forces lined up against the Iraqi border. So Norman Schwarzkopf staged radio broadcasts. He positioned forces. He had a bunch of fake tanks and fake artillery and made Saddam Hussein successfully or successfully made Saddam Hussein think that the coalition was going to march through Kuwait. And, you know, come in through the sea in Kuwait. So Saddam Hussein placed all of his forces in Kuwait, allowing the U.S. to just roll right in and surround Iraq within 100 hours. So the Gulf War was won relatively quickly just by a successful information operation. The other target for information warfare is soldiers. You want to convince your soldiers that you are the good guys, that you are fighting a morally justified war and that you are capable of winning. You also want to convince your soldiers that the enemy is evil, that the enemy deserves to be killed, and vice versa. You want to convince the enemy that you're that they're not going to win. You want to convince the enemy to surrender, throw down their arms, and defect. And lastly, the most important target that we're going to talk about are civilians. In a democratic society, the civilian population needs to support war, pure and simple. Uh, they need to vote for candidates that are going to support the war effort. They need to make some form of sacrifice to support the war effort, and they need to be willing to volunteer and go fight. Or if they're drafted, they need to be willing to submit to the draft and go fight. So you need to encourage your civilians, and you simultaneously need to discourage the adversary civilians. And so one big way that that happens is through propaganda. And we want, as media, to be able to see through military propaganda and understand what is truthful, what is not truthful. So we'll look at about 100 years or so of information warfare as it's happened in the United States. And we go back to World War I, because that's about 100 years ago, and it's relative, it has a lot of good examples of information warfare. So think back to the media ecosystem of the time. The television had not been invented for 10 years. Radio existed, but at the time, the government had actually banned private radios because they wanted to be able to control messaging around the war effort. So at the time, you had newspapers and you had silent film. That was it. And newspapers, you need a lot of money to be able to produce a newspaper. So there was the information was in the hands of a select few people. President Wilson also established the Committee on Public Information, also known as the Creel Committee. And that committee existed to create and spread positive information about the war effort, keeping up morale at home and convincing Americans that going to fight in France and Germany was a good thing to do. So the committee created newsreels that were shown in theaters. They created pamphlets that were distributed in communities, and they actively worked to get pro-war stories placed in the newspaper. And there was also a group of people called the Four Minute Men. These were volunteers that went and got trained on how to give patriotic pro-war speeches in their churches and communities. So you had an entire country of people that were getting mostly the same information filtered by the government um, and controlled by you know, a select group of people. So everybody in the country got the same information. Um, like this quote says from uh, Michael Sweeney in a book about uh, World War II or World War censorship, every piece of information that the public got was approved by the government and filtered. So there was a free press, but the only information that the free press got was approved by the government. So you go to the next, oh yeah, sorry, I'm going to show this video. This is an example of some newsreel footage that you might have seen during World War I. And what I want you to do in the two minutes that I show it is pay attention to what you see and pay attention to what you're not seeing. And we'll talk about it um, in a second. So this is a two minute clip from World War I. 
Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Johnny. Uh, real quick, Monica, I see a hand raised. Sorry, that was a that's a mistake. Oh, okay, no worries. I'm monitoring the question chat for questions. Okay, so yeah, uh, let me know if there's any questions after I play the video, and we'll discuss it. He stole the hun, you're a son of a gun. Hoist the flag and let the fly. Yankee, do, 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 or die. Pack your little kit, show your grit, do your bit. Yankee, to the rank from the towns and the tanks. Make your mother proud of you and the old red, white, and blue. Over there. Okay, so you looked at that. Does anybody, you know, have any comments on what they saw? I don't think I have access to the chat. Let me see if I do or not. Um, did anybody notice anything that stands out or doesn't stand out about that video? Okay, I don't know if I'm going to be able to see that or not, but I'll point out a few things. Did anybody see anybody getting killed? It looked like everybody was just having a grand old time. They're uh, on like a camping trip with their friends. They are just uh, showing up, having fun. Okay, yeah, so Jacqueline says lots of smiles. Anonymous attendee says the video makes war look fun and mild. Right. I call this the, the smile for the camera effect. You know, these guys are out there and the camera gets pointed at them. They're smiling. But yeah, I mean, you don't see anybody getting killed. You don't see any serious combat. And actually, something I noticed when I was watching this earlier today, I'm going to see yeah. if I can drop to it. Get your gun. Don't need to hear the song. Um, look at the horses. Where is it? Look at the horses in the background. Where is, I don't know. Either way, there's a part where it shows horses in the background and it looks like they're just like fake horses being strung along on a string. So this was everything that the Americans back home saw. It looked like the war was fun. I can tell you, not from experience, but from reading books, World War I was super uncool and a lot of people died. And this makes it look like they were away at summer camp. Let's see a couple more things in the chat. Not showing the actual hardships of war, what's going on exactly. So let's go forward another decade or so to World War II. I'm going to warn you all, there's going to be some pictures on here that are, I'm just going to say it, they're pretty horribly offensive. They show very dehumanizing stereotypes that were used as propaganda, but I'm going to show them because it's important to understand how information warfare dehumanizes the other side. So you had a very similar media ecosystem. The only difference was that more homes had radios. Television wasn't still a thing. So you had newsreels, you had posters, you'd had advertisements. And you really began to see the widespread adoption of propaganda designed to dehumanize the enemy. So the next thing I'm going to show you is a picture of Nazi propaganda that's very anti-Semitic, but it needs to be shown. So this is Nazi propaganda that shows stereotypes of Jews. This is American propaganda that shows stereotypes of Japanese. It is content like this that made it possible for the Nazis to round up Jews, and it made it possible for the Americans to round up Japanese Americans and put them in internment camps. And it made it possible for soldiers to be, you know, willing to indiscriminate, not indiscriminately, but it made it easier for soldiers to kill the enemy, dehumanizing content. 
I've not been able to place where this poster came from. I think it's Russian, but it shows the Nazis as werewolves. And I mean, the Nazis were patently evil, but it is still an example of dehumanizing propaganda. And even targeting children. My grandmother was born in 1937 and you know she died in 2011. And she still said a lot of horribly racist things about the Japanese because she grew up watching cartoons like this. This was a pro-war anti-Japanese Popeye cartoon from the early 1940s. So you had this dehumanizing propaganda targeting an entire society that made it possible to round up innocent civilians and put them in camps and exterminate them, or you know, have a lifetime of hatred against an entire community. So this is another newsreel from World War II. And uh, same thing, I kind of want to just watch it, uh, you know, two minutes of it. And tell me what you see. Tell me what you show, what it shows, and what it doesn't show. America prepares. All America alters its pattern of life and work to meet the demand for protection. Industry is a double step to supply the sinews of safety. The armaments of war that an embattled world must have if democracy is to survive. Mechanical genius joins with the muscle of millions of men working to win for the ways of freedom. Freedom to think, to speak, to rise, live, and plan with one's fellow man. America's vast resources are harnessed to the job of being the world arsenal for this and other democracies. Its present day production of armaments is but a mere fraction of the great job that lies ahead. <laughs> The flow of production in plant and shipyard gains speed. Vessels of all types, carriers, merchantmen, submarines, slip off the ways in growing numbers. And the beat of feet sounds over the land. Feet intent on training, on growing fit for whatever destiny holds ahead. Heroes, everyone. Heroes by the million. Men who abandon home and vocations that they may be ready to defend democracy if necessary. Sturdy of body, firm in spirit, seamen, marines, soldiers, and flyers. A huge civilian army joins in this great defense program. Rigid rough work, this training. Actual combat is simulated, conditions met and mastered. No problem that may arise will find these men wanting. Men like these are not to be stopped. No individual, no evasive words or deeds, no group action or selfish interests, will be allowed to impede their growing strength, effectiveness, and safety. For it is they who are sacrificing every advantage of civilian life. They who hold the torch of freedom closest. Okay, so same question. What do we notice about that? What is missing from that? You know, I'll say what I noticed at the very least. You noticed it's all good news. It is all, you know, America is rallying around everything. It doesn't show any of the hiccups that were happening. It doesn't show any bad news. Everything is good to go. Um, so yeah, like the anonymous attendee says, it glorifies everything. It doesn't show death. And if you watch this, and if this was the only thing you as a member of the public were watching, I mean, guess what? You're going to be, you know, motivated as a civilian. You have good home front morale. So that is an example of some... I don't know if I want to go so far as to call it misinformation, but definitely censored, controlled information from World War II. Ooh, a lot of chats. Hero, hero, hero. Yeah, I uh, definitely, you know, a lot of focus on hero heroism. And I mean, there was a lot of heroism during World War II. If any of you have seen my previous lectures, you know some of the pitfalls of using the word hero to describe everybody in the military, but that's not what today's about. So we're gonna fast forward a little bit to Vietnam. Uh, a lot of people ask why I skipped Korea. The media ecosystem was roughly the same in Korea. Vietnam was where it changed quite a bit. Just about every house had a television during the Vietnam era and live combat footage was being beamed into every American house every night. And the government no longer had full control of the message. And there was a lot more explicitly anti-war content shown on TV and in movies. And you notice Vietnam was the, considered to be the first majorly unpopular war. It coincides with the lack of government control over what people see, because now anybody can watch live TV of what's going on. And there was also more anti-war content shown on TV 
and in the movies. The show MASH, one of my all-time favorites, <coughs> you know, they explicitly say war is hell. This is just a 30-second clip that would be you get the would be incomprehensible this airing during World War One or World War Two. Oh, I did not mean for that to skip. Ever get the feeling there's a war going on? There's always a war going on. War is the world's favorite spectator sport. And these more skin sutures. Oh, everybody knows war is hell. Remember, you heard it here last. War isn't hell. War is war and hell is hell. And of the two, war is a lot worse. How do you figure that, Hawkeye? Easy, Bonnie. Tell me, who goes to hell? Well, sinners, I believe. Exactly. There are no innocent bystanders in hell. But war is shot full of them. Little kids, cripples, old ladies. In fact, except for a few of the brass, almost everybody involved is an innocent bystander. So I could not comprehend something like that playing during World War II, but during the Vietnam era, more explicitly anti-war content was over, or, you know, all over TV. And so that impacted public perception of the war. There was a lot more protesting. So the military tried to compensate for this by doing its own internal media control. This is a clip from a movie, Full Metal Jacket. It's one of my favorites because... I feel like it's about me. It's about a war correspondent dealing with an organization that's trying to control the message. So when you watch this video, listen to how they try to shape the narrative about war. Diplomats and dungarees, marine engineers lend a helping hand rebuilding Dong Phuc Village. Chile, if we move Vietnamese, they are evacuees. They come to us to be evacuated. They are refugees. I'll make a note of it, sir. NVA soldier deserts after reading pamphlets. A young North Vietnamese Army regular who realized his side could not win the war desert from his unit after reading open arms program pamphlets. That's good, Dave. But why say North Vietnamese Army regular? Is there an irregular? How about North Vietnamese Army soldier? I'll fix it up, sir. Lawrence Walk Show is going to go out on TV in two weeks. Dave, do 100 words on it. AFTV will give you some background stuff. Sir. Not while we're eating. NVA learned Marines on a search and destroy mission don't like to be interrupted while eating chow. Search and destroy. Um, we have a new directive from MAF on this. In the future, in place of search and destroy, substitute the phrase sweep and clear. Sweep and clear. Got it? Got it. Very catchy. And Joker, where's the weenie? Sir? The kill, Joker, the kill. I mean, all that fire, the grunt must have hit something. Didn't see him. Joker, I've told you we run two basic stories here. Grunts who give half their pay to buy toothbrushes and deodorants, winning of hearts and minds, okay? And combat action that results in a kill, winning the war. Now, you must have seen blood trails. Drag marks. It was raining, sir. That's why God passed the law of probability. I'll rewrite it and give it a happy ending. Say uh, one kill. Make it a sapper or an officer. Which? Whichever you say. Grunts like reading about dead officers. Okay, an officer. How about a general? <laughs> Joker, maybe you'd like our guys to read the paper and feel bad. And in case you didn't know it, this is not a particularly popular war. Now, it is our job to report the news that these uh, why are we here civilian newsmen ignore. So... In that video, just notice how they control the language. Instead of saying search and destroy, they say sweep and clear. You know, if they come to us, they are refugees. If we move them, they are evacuees. And then, you know, we do these two kinds of stories, hearts and minds and combat action. And then why, you know, these, why are we here civilian newsmen? They're working to control the information sphere in the best way possible. So we'll move on. Diplomats to Desert Storm and post 9-11. So after 9-11, for the first time, the US had been attacked on its own soil. And there was a rabid need for revenge among society and rallying around the flag. And so news that was critical of the military, critical of the war effort was considered unpatriotic. And a lot of journalists didn't do anything covering that. It was taken for granted that the US was gonna go into Afghanistan and do whatever needed to be done to punish the people responsible for 9-11. There were also embedded correspondents and war reporters who offered 24 seven coverage on cable news. I was 13 years old when the US invaded Iraq and I remember watching it happen on live TV. That had never really happened before. The shock and awe as you can see from the CNN video. 
I'm also going to recommend for any aspiring journalist who wants to cover combat, read the book Generation Kill um, by Rolling Stone reporter Evan Wright. He embedded with the 1st Recon Battalion during the invasion of Iraq. And if any of you have watched the uh, show on Fox Special Forces Challenge, I think it's called the uh, guy Rudy. This is his unit. He's featured heavily in the book and in the HBO series. Now, a more insidious form of information warfare against the U.S. that used the media during Iraq was the Pentagon Military Analyst Program. So the Bush administration recruited a bunch of retired generals and colonels and admirals to serve as military analysts on cable news. And they were trained by the Pentagon to go on cable news, posing as independent analysts to spread the Bush administration's messaging on Iraq. The New York Times uncovered this information in 2008, and you know it showed that the U.S. government was actively spreading information on cable news at the time, their message. And then there's the concept of paid patriotism. So anytime you go to an NFL game and you see the, the big displays, the DOD pays for that. So those are patriotic displays paid for by the government just to you know raise support for the military and for war effort. And then lastly, the modern era. So we're talking about the last couple of years of war. We have seen significant developments in information warfare, both in Russia, Ukraine, and in the Israel-Hamas war that's going on right now. We now have social media. Anybody with a smartphone can post whatever information they want to post, and people will take it seriously. Um, yeah, so anybody with a smartphone and an internet connection is now a war reporter. And so non-official sources can share whatever information they want, and that information will spread and influence people. So there are NGOs that do it, there are researchers that do it, there are experts that do it that generally can be trusted, but you also have bad actors who are actively trying to spread mis- and disinformation. We also have a much more competitive news media environment. News media lives by the analytic and dies by the analytic. They're driven by clicks and engagement. And so they, their entire business model relies on them being the first and relies on them getting the most clicks. So they're more willing to post sensational stories and clickbait. Additionally, there are fewer journalists out there to vet information. I mean, you see this in local newspapers. It's also in big national publications that cover war. There are fewer journalists out there to vet information. And social media creates a fast-paced environment. I remember in the early days of the 2022 invasion where Russia had invaded Ukraine, they began shelling the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. And somebody tweeted that if the shelling continued, this would be the equivalent of 10 Chernobyls, because that, I mean, that's terrifying. You see that Chernobyl one was bad. Imagine 10 of them. <clears throat> and a bunch of members of the mainstream press retweeted that. And it was terrifying. I was sitting at home freaking out that, my God, 10 Chernobyls in Ukraine. A bunch of nuclear physicists and experts in the field said, no, this is, would not even be one Chernobyl. It is a small fire on an outbuilding. This is dangerous, but it's not going to be 10 Chernobyls. So you had one person tweet something sensational that everybody picked up on, even though all of the experts in the field said it would never be nowhere near that bad. It takes a lot of time to analyze evidence and intelligence from a combat zone. And that's time that news agencies don't want to or can't afford to take. And so that is how misinformation in modern warfare spreads. So a big example of an information warfare campaign from the last couple of years was Vladimir Putin and his use of the N-word. And I'm not talking about the racial slur, I'm talking about the word nuclear. After he invaded Ukraine, he made some thinly veiled threats to use nuclear weapons there, and the U.S. media picked up on it immediately, and understandably so. It's a terrifying, sensational story that drives engagement. Everybody in the world, when they see a picture of some sort of you know, nuclear weapon exploding, thinking it could be raining down on Phoenix in you know, 10, with 10 minutes notice, they follow that. And it got to the point where anytime somebody in the Russian government even mentioned the existence of Russian nuclear weapons, it became a headline on you know, lots of you know, less reputable news sites. Basically, if the Russian equivalent of Marjorie Taylor Greene mentioned nuclear weapons, it was a major headline. And anybody who studies nuclear deterrence theory understands that 
the reason, you know, a key component of nuclear deterrence is reminding the adversary that you have these weapons and that you can use them if you want to. Most intelligence experts did not believe that Russia had any intention of using nuclear weapons. There was no incentive for them to do it. But simply by mentioning the, ex the existence of their weapons and simply by keeping it in the news, it did a very good job of scaring Americans into not supporting arming Ukraine. Um, and the news media, like it or not, played a role in this information warfare staged by the Russian government. Uh, you know, all of these articles, I remember, let's see, where is it? Putin Reddy's massive Yars nuclear missile. They've had these missiles for years. Um, but his military released a picture of them just doing a drill like every nuclear power does with their weapons. And the American media ran with it. Um, or, you know, them testing a missile from a submarine. The U.S. tests missiles from submarines all the time. Our submarines get underway all the time. It's not necessarily news, but because people were on edge and scared, it became news. And that's part of the information fight. So that's, you know, a long history of information warfare and how we see it play out. So I want to talk about who we can and can't trust and make sure I'm doing good on time, doing good on time. So who can we trust? Good sources. So people that you can trust, but you should still verify. You should never trust anybody implicitly. When I was a grad student at Cronkite, my instructor said, if your own mother tells you she loves you, you should verify that. And I'm going to say, verify everything that you see. Uh, Non-governmental organizations or NGOs are generally pretty trustworthy um, when talking about their area of expertise. They can be biased towards their mission, as they generally are, but they are reliable at reporting the impacts of conflict on civilian populations. So if an NGO like Doctors Without Borders or Amnesty International reports on something, you can take that relatively seriously, obviously verify the information, don't report it as fact unless you verified it, but they can generally be trusted. You can also generally trust civilians in the theater of war in terms of sharing their story. A civilian sharing their story about how the war has affected them can generally be believed if it's their story and if, especially if they have video or photo evidence to corroborate their story. We see a lot of modern combat correspondents focusing on the civilian impacts because civilians can generally be more trusted to share what's happening to them. And then I put a fair amount of faith in the UN. If the UN reports something, it can generally be trusted. Again, trust but verify. The next level of source I like to follow, you know, they're acceptable sometimes. Just be careful. Non-belligerent governments. So neutral governments that are not involved in the conflict can generally be trusted, but you need to consider their motivations. Are they actually neutral? Um, in the Israel-Hamas war, is the US neutral? Is Lebanon neutral? Is Egypt neutral? They are not necessarily involved in the war, but it's pretty obvious that they have taken sides. So be very careful about listening to what those governments say and you know, understand that they might have an underlying motivation. You can also generally trust some vetted social media experts as long as you consider their background and expertise and education before relying on them. If some guy with a blue check mark posts something, you better look at that person's LinkedIn. You better see what their affiliation is and what their expertise actually is. Now that you can buy a blue check mark, blue check marks are meaningless. Um, so always make sure that if you are taking information from a social media expert, that you do a thorough background research on them and that they're not just some random schmuck on the internet. And then news media. News media is generally trustworthy, but we talked about the problems that it has. There are problems in the news media that make it, you know, that need to be looked at before you can trust them 100%. Independent news media can generally be trusted. So major newspapers in the US, New York Times, major newspapers in European countries um, that have a good deal of press freedom can generally be trusted. But news media in belligerent countries, generally, I would not listen to it. And especially if that country does not have a good history of press freedom. I would certainly hope that none of you would take reporting from the Moscow newspaper about how things are going in Ukraine seriously. Same as if how I wouldn't take you know, every day or so, the Kiev Independent posts casualty numbers, and they say close to half a million Russian soldiers have been killed. 
I think that number is inflated. That's just me. I'm not an expert, but I would not trust that, especially in countries where press freedom is less than stellar. And then lastly, sources that you should take with a big, heavy grain of salt, belligerent sides and their allies. Governments are always you know, going to present the information that makes them look best and serve their objective. And then I say this as somebody who served as a military public affairs person, before we would let press get in front of a soldier, we made sure that that soldier had media training, knew how to give an interview, and knew how to you know, give the official line. They were going to tell the best story possible. So be very careful when you get information from belligerent sides and their allies. A recent example of this is the hospital in Hamas that had, or hospital in Gaza that had the explosion. Initially, Hamas reported that it was an Israeli airstrike that damaged that hospital and killed people, and media ran with it. And then Israeli and U.S. intelligence came out and said, no, actually, it was a Hamas rocket that destroyed that hospital. And the last I checked, the New York Times still has not been able to drill down what really happened because they haven't been able to verify the official intelligence released by the IDF and the U.S. government. So be very careful when you listen to a belligerent side. <clears throat> and again, news media in belligerent countries take it with a very heavy grain of salt. And then unvetted social media. I'm going to show you an example of unvetted social media, but there are deep fakes everywhere. There is footage from old wars. There is training footage that comes out. There is all sorts of stuff on social media that I would not trust and nobody should really trust. So this is a photo um, really recently released that shows an American general being, you know, allegedly being killed by uh, Hezbollah, I believe. Now, if you have ever been in the military, you would know that this photo is wrong for a lot of reasons. Number one, the general is wearing a uniform that the U.S. hasn't used in combat since 2005. Um, number two, that general was the top U.S. commander in Iraq in 2005. And so a reliable source on Twitter fact-checked this photo. Jim Laporta, for those of you that don't know, Jim Laporta is a former AP investigative reporter. He is a very well-respected military reporter, and he's a former Marine Corps infantryman, so he knows his stuff. And he, you know, was able to prove that this is General George Casey from 2005, and Casey is still alive. So this photo was blatant misinformation, but it had thousands and thousands of retweets that, oh, wow, a U.S. general was killed on the ground in Israel. That's terrifying news to think about it, because that means the U.S. is probably going to get involved. And something that takes 30 seconds to do that everybody should do before they retweet a photo, copy the photo and paste it into TinEye, reverse image search. And within 0.4 seconds, this image was found in 23 separate places. And with a little bit of digging, you see that it's an image from 2005 during the US operation in Iraq. The last thing I wanna really touch on today is, oh, we got a Q and A, what do we got? So yeah, the person says you can likely trust X source, but always verify. How does one verify? It's very hard to tell what an acceptable source is. Um, you know, verification is a challenging thing to do. Um, but what I suggest doing is at the very least, if they post an image or a video, do a reverse image search of that video or picture to see if it's been posted before. And for early career journalists, find a network of people that you can follow that are trustable. Jim Laporta, the reason I follow him is because he has been very good at um, you know, doing the verification. I wish I was able to get him to come give this lecture because he does this a lot more than I do, but find sources that you can rely on and use them as a separate means of verification. If you see someone publish a piece of information, I'll use the example of the Kyiv newspaper that publishes uh, tallies of you know, the number of Russian soldiers killed in the Russian-Ukraine war, that number looks pretty high. So cross-check that. The US government releases information, the British government releases information. And so you're never probably gonna get a perfect number of soldiers killed, but information from 10 sources 
is going to get you a clearer picture than information from one unreliable source. And I know that sounds kind of contradictory where I'm saying, you know, you rely on U.S. information, rely on government information. But the more information you have, the easier it is to verify something and the clearer picture you have. So the biggest piece of advice I have to offer is get as much information as you can. Um, I hope that answers the question. I can talk a little bit more about that, you know, at the end when we do Q and A. Um, but I also wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about uh, mental health aspects of covering warfare. I have to turn the radio off when I'm driving because the coverage of what's going on gets to be really bleak and depressing. And there is a lot of research that shows that journalists who cover conflict have PT and PTSD and mental health diagnosis similar to combat veterans. This is data from 2002. I have not been able to find more recent information and it requires self-reporting. So that infra number is probably a lot worse now. Um, veterans have access to the VA and they have society that is willing to say, you know, yeah, what you went through is traumatic, you deserve treatment. Journalists don't have that support structure. There is no dedicated government in institution that treats journalists with mental health disorders. And there is still a strong culture of silence in newsrooms that you just have to suck it up and the story is the most important thing. Um, even journalists who don't cover war and conflict have mental health disorders similar in numbers to first responders. Journalists covering major you know, natural disasters or even traumatic things that happen at home still have mental health disorders that come from seeing that. And this culture of silence in newsrooms is shifting, but it has not changed as fast as the culture within the military and within the public safety industry, I don't want to say industry, but within the public safety profession. So before reporting on anything that might be traumatic or anything that might even be dangerous to you, you need to do a very good job of assessing your mental state. Where are you mentally? Are you resilient and ready to face whatever you're about to face? Or are you still struggling and still you know, depressed, anxious, whatever? You are the most important thing. Um, you also wanna make sure that you're defining your objective. When you go out, you know, and I'll say this as somebody who has reported on civil unrest in the US, both in Portland and in Phoenix, I've covered multiple riots, including the, you know, the 2020 riots here and another riot in Portland. When you go out, you are putting yourself into a dangerous situation. You should know exactly what it is that you're looking for and how you're going to get that. So what I always do is I come up with a list of shots that I want to get. Um, and if I'm talking to people, I come up with a list of, you know, if not full questions, at least information that I want to ask and then potential sources that I want to talk to when I'm in the field. Um, if you're embedding with a unit or you're going with somebody, go over your plan come up with an area that you're gonna meet up with if you get separated. Um, you know, have a plan for if the worst case scenario happens. I always wrote my editor's phone number on my arm so that if I lost my phone, if I got arrested, if anything happened, I would know that I have my editor's phone number that I can call. Prepare for the worst case scenario, plan for it, and hope that it doesn't happen. So while you're out reporting on conflict, and again, this can be civil unrest at home in the US or it can be war anywhere, monitor your stress levels. Make sure that you're okay. You are more important than the story. The news organization will survive if you don't get a perfect story, but you will not survive if you allow yourself to put yourself into unnecessary danger or damage your mental health to the point where you are no longer able to report. So monitor your stress levels, focus on your objective, Limit your exposure as much as possible. There is no reason to subject yourself to unnecessary danger. It doesn't make you a hero. It just it, don't subject yourself to unnecessary danger. And when you are in danger, do your best to focus on the big picture. Something that helped me in combat that I kind of came to accept years later was that I saw combat through the screen of my camera. And so it kind of separated me from what I was seeing. So in the moment, it was like, oh, I'm looking at this on video. It took me a little while to come to terms with the fact that like, oh, wow, I was there for that. I witnessed that. And I was just standing by with my camera. Thank God for therapy. Always be willing to seek therapy. Therapy does not make you less of a person. It does not make you weak. It makes you stronger. And admitting that you're having a problem is good. 
And then again, when you're done reporting on conflict, always monitor your stress levels. Do your best to rest, relax, and do something that makes you happy. Find a hobby, find something, whether that's playing a video game or building a model train, you know, whatever hobbies people have nowadays. Do something for yourself. And always try to have a network of people that you trust. Um, people that have been through similar experiences to you that you can commiserate with, that you can share with. Lean on your safety net. And always pay attention to your psychological responses. Um, I'm going to be a little candid here and uh, just you know tell you about something that happened to me. I was I got out of the military in 2014, and it wasn't until Christmas 2017 that I really realized that I was having some serious mental health problems. And Christmas 2017, I couldn't handle it anymore, and I wasn't actively suicidal, but I was relying on a I was relying on substances to tolerate my feelings. And I ended up checking myself into the VA hospital and getting help because I paid attention to my psychological responses. If you cannot pay attention to how you're feeling, you're not going to be able to help yourself. So when you're flying on an airplane and they say, secure your own mask before helping others, do you know why they say that? They say that because in that situation, you have about 10 seconds of useful consciousness until you pass out. So if you are struggling to put your child's mask on and you don't put your own mask on, you're going to pass out and then both you and the child are going to be in danger. If you put your mask on, you will have what it takes to help other people around you. So always put yourself first, prioritize yourself and be willing to um, help other people. Um, so yeah, we have about 10 minutes left. That's all I had. I guess this went a little faster than I was planning. So please put Q&A in the chat um, and let's ask. So Dawn says, how will an editor or producer react to a reporter saying they aren't mentally ready for a story? And what's a good response or way to prep for that conversation? So I'm going to come out and say that a good editor should listen to you. If an editor tells you to I'm going to curse here. I'm sorry. You know, we have this mentality, the suck it the fuck up snowflake mentality. If an editor tells you to suck it up and do it anyway, and is willing to put you in danger that you're not prepared or comfortable for, um, that's not a good editor. And a good editor is going to make sure that their team is capable of handling the story. And, you know, they should understand that their employees come first. And, if you are hurt or killed or, you know, injured in any way reporting the story, that's going to look bad on them. So do not do something that you are not willing to do. Uh, Landry says, if a non-belligerent government supports one side in a conflict, how can the government sway the news coverage in independent news organizations? So my understanding of this question, let's just, again, I'll, I'll point to the U.S. support for Israel in this current situation. Uh, the U.S. openly supports Israel. The U.S. openly supports Ukraine in this war. Um, how does it sway news coverage in independent news organizations? I will again go back to the example of the uh, hospital in Gaza. The U.S. released information and intelligence that seemed to suggest that the explosion at the hospital in Gaza was caused by Hamas. And so lots of independent news organizations ran with that. And the last I checked, the New York Times was still vetting those photos. So the New York Times actually is questioning the official line of the U.S. government. So, you know, the military and the government itself, the Defense Department, has a massive public relations and media infrastructure. I was a part of that. I think it is critical to understand that they are going to um, they're going to go with what is best for them. So just understand that non-belligerent government is going to sway the news coverage the same way any public relations entity attempts to sway the news coverage. Lindsay says, you mentioned the U.S. government has paid ads prioritizing patriotism. Do you notice, notice a similar pattern of influence through pop culture pieces like Band of Brothers? <clears throat> So I really, you know, we have a fair amount of people on this. I wish more of you would have attended my lecture that I gave last semester. It is very common, the military media complex, for the military to officially sponsor 
entertainment media, uh, Top Gun, the the movie that had a lot of support from the military, and so it's going to present the you know the military as the best institution possible. Um, Band of Brothers is a good example. I think Band of Brothers is more accurate, a more accurate depiction of conflict and combat than anything like that. But there is definitely, I mean, you even see it on TikTok and on social media, people that are in the military whose job it is to post on TikTok and social media about how great it is being in the military. So Monica, are we just about out of time? Uh, we we are almost out of time. Okay. Uh, I asked if there's any other questions. We got a couple. Um, we would have time for one last question if there's someone out there that wants, but otherwise, uh, I think you've given us a lot to think about, Scott. I really appreciate your time. Um, for the folks that are still on, I'm hoping that maybe we can continue this conversation next semester. I hope so. So, uh, yeah, thank you for everyone that attended and uh, I'm happy to be, you know, if anybody has any questions that you want me to follow up on, just shoot me an email. My uh, email's on the ASU website. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.